were to focus on describing, explaining, and arguing in his or her subject, then this wouldn't nearly be as much work. Because, and I don't want to go into that too much right now, but the experts on those grammar functions, and they call them cognitive discourse functions, they seem to agree that it's basically just a handful of these functions. It's describing, it's uh, explaining, it's evaluating and arguing, it's probably uh, narrating, reporting, and writing about processes, but that's more or less it. So that's not an infinite number, and that is nothing that we can handle together. But if every teacher were to focus on these basic academic skills or thinking skills, and then show them how this thinking is done through the subject, then we could benefit from each other's work. And if every teacher, as I said, were to focus maybe just five minutes per lesson on one of these things, and it could be done very organically, at the end, summing up, could you please explain what we did today? Or I wanted you to learn about global warming, can you define it in your own words? And what would be different from the way we used to teach is that we would follow up with another question saying, do you think that definition was good enough? Or can we make it even better? And how can we make it better? It's, that's not difficult. And once we're aware of this, it's also not too time consuming. And the, the big advantage that we, uh, that we see when we combine those language functions, discourse functions with the systemic functional approach, which seems really theoretical, but there's a huge advantage, is that we have realized that these smaller functions, like explaining, arguing, defining, describing, and so on, when they're combined, then they form the basis of bigger text types or genres. So the way these things are combined and specified through subject-specific lenses is how we produce bigger text types. So we can focus on the smaller things and we can focus, uh, we can focus on the bigger text types, but they will consist of these things. That's why we work with Lego bricks, because that is how we imagine this to work. And we have this from uh, a literature on social semiotics. So this seems to be very solid, and it works in class, which means we don't have to focus on a huge lab report every lesson. But maybe we do it once per semester and say, you know, in the first part of this year, we will focus on a lab report, or maybe, and in the second part of the year, we will do another one, and let's see if we can do, do it much better. And that way, it becomes something that we as teachers can handle. And then we can focus on the smaller parts. So it doesn't have to be scary, and it doesn't have to mean that we have to totally relearn everything from scratch. It's just a little, more focused on making things visible. And what we get in return is students who become much better at expressing their understanding, which should make the subject teacher in us really happy. Okay, so there's many words, and what we've come to learn is that it's a simple fact that has been you know, stated many, many times but academic language or the language of schooling simply is a foreign language to every child. So they have to learn. And the kids who know these things, they probably know them not because of us teachers, but because they were born into a family where they are trained in these things. And so these are things that we can simply add to our curriculum because we know about the ramifications. So these things will help them develop cognitive skills. It will help them become better thinkers. And we can develop their mindsets. So same thing here. We can show them systematically how to write a good definition. And there's so many books on, uh, on teaching for understanding and so on and so forth. And you'll find so many examples like 
Uh, I remember one interview with a student where he said, you know, my teacher, the comment that I got on my science essay was, please, you have to be more precise. And then they asked the kid and said, and what can you, what can you learn from this? And he said, nothing. Because if I knew how to write more precisely, precisely, I certainly would have done so, right? So what good is that feedback? We would, we would have to be able to say, okay, I want you to write, to work on your definitions because they're not good enough. And please revise the rules we learned for definitions and the many activities that we did to work on definitions. And if that is something, I'm sure that can be developed together. Because every, I'm sure that every discipline or every subject sooner or later needs definitions. So these are things that can be developed together. So there's, and that's the problem with the construct of, uh, with cognitive academic language proficiency. I think it's more complex than Jim Cummings had anticipated in the 80s. This, what you see here is the construct that Nicole used in her PhD. And that is something we, where we use all the latest research and psychology and everything to conceptualize what we mean by subject-specific literacy and how we can measure it. And what we realized is that it's basically not possible to separate them. But students will use everyday language and mix it with academic language. So these are much more interrelated. And we have to get students to do some sort of code switching. Say, can you explain that in simple terms? But also, please use your scientific language because it is important. So we try to come up with ways of assessing and measuring subject-specific literacy, but only for one function, only for explaining. But what we can say with quite some confidence, because we had great psychologists helping us on this, that when we compare CLIL students, normal CLIL students, to those who received additional training in deeper learning, uh, then we can see clear effects. Then this kind of training has effects on their subject-specific language, but also on their generic academic language. And we did that in one classroom with the control group and then tried to replicate the whole setting in another federal state, same age group, but very different population, and the result was similar. And as you can see, the effect sizes are very strong. So this seems to indicate that the time we invest in trying to get our students to understand things at a deeper level is very well spent. And hopefully, uh, and I hope that once we have the data complete that all the other researchers, okay, will take it apart and say, maybe you got it wrong with one or two of these components it needs to be better, but that would be progress, right? So we would come up with something much better and hopefully in the not too distant future have something that we can break down for teachers. And we're working at this to, uh, to work, to develop rating scales that we can use at school to assess uh, the quality of language of our students, which will not look so much at grammar, but how deep is his understanding and how well does he language this understanding? And uh, as I said, we will not be able to do that alone and that's why we have been working with Nagore and Pilar and people from Finland and other countries. That's huge, but 10 years ago, nobody would have believed that uh, 10 years ago we could uh, come up with something like that. And that's just because we work in teams. So this is, us, this is what we try to do. And if you're interested in these materials, we've put them online. If you Google Plural Literacies, you'll find our ECML website. We've produced materials 
for geography, history, and chemistry so far. And hopefully soon we will have stuff for the real sciences like math, uh, math physics, and so on. But it's a matter of finding the right people. Hopefully, I did not waste your time. Maybe I had this one or other idea that you find useful. And maybe uh, there's just one little thing or two that you can actually uh, take back into your classrooms. Thanks so much for the invitation. Thank you.